Today we're going to look at some very old tech in Elite Dangerous. I'm going to show you how we can locate Voyager 1. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Elite Dangerous with Down to Earth Astronomy and to another Worth a Visit video. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. Normally we go to a place and I talk about it and then I give you a montage at the end of the video. But today I'm going to show you how you can locate Voyager 1. Yes, that Voyager 1. The one launched back in the 70s, which has been leaving the solar system ever since. Of course, the first order of business in order to fight Voyager 1 is to jump into Sol. As soon as we arrive in the system, we're just gonna turn away from the star here. And then we're gonna jump into the... Just slow us down a little bit here. We're gonna jump into the galaxy map. And in the galaxy map, we're going to look for a system called Col 285 Sector TOQ. You can see it all here. I'm going to put it in the description as well. Uh, it's a long system name. Anyway, as you can see it out here, um, quite far away. That's okay. Don't plot a route. You want to click select. Don't plot a route, select. Because if you plot a route, you're going to select the next system in your route. Um, and that's not what you want. You want to select that system, which is right there. And then we're going to begin heading in that direction. Now, Voyager 1 is 2,317,434 light seconds out. So this is going to take a while. So get a cup of coffee and just begin heading out in, uh, in that direction. And keep an eye on your distance to the sun, uh, either in here in navigation panel or simply by uh, targeting it. Because now you know which direction you're going. You don't need to target the system. And now you can keep an eye on uh, the distance to Sol in... Um, in the main panel here. When you begin to approach the correct distance, it's not important whether you are 100,000 or 200,000 light seconds off at this point, we need to begin to align ourselves up. Now it's important to note that of course you can only see the actual signal from the um, from the probe, from the Voyager 1, when you are within a thousand light seconds. So we need to be pretty damn accurate. And in order to do that, of course, as I said, we need to align ourselves up so that we are in the right direction. And this is going to be an iterative process where we're going to line ourselves up. Then we're going to try to get close to the uh, to the right distance again. Then we're going to line ourselves up and adjust our distance. And we're going to keep doing that. I think I went through three iterations of this before I got and finally found the signal. So this is something you have to do over and over until you actually get there. But in order to line yourself up, what you're going to do is you're going to slow your ship down. Still stay in super cruise. Slow your ship down and wait until it's down to those what 30 kilometers a second. I think is the lowest. Then you're going to come into the external camera and you're going to get it as far away as you can looking at the sun while you can still see your ship when you're fully zoomed in. If you're not familiar with using this camera, I do have a full guide on how to set it up for, um, for I think I used it for a joystick, but just in general how it works. A link for that in the Moif icon up here. Um, so go into your external camera, set it up, disable rotation lock and what we're looking for here is uh, to look towards the sun. You can see the sun. Here's the bright star in the middle. You can see Andromeda out here, Mesa 31. And with the small dwarf galaxy orbiting around it, Mesa 110. And a nebula up here. So use those for reference. Makes it easier to locate where the sun is. Okay. Once in here, you will notice uh, pretty much the perfectly aligned with the uh, dwarf galaxy and Andromeda. You can see these two bright stars down here. Um just below and to the right of the sun. We're going to use those for reference later. And right here next to the sun, there is a very faint star, and we're going to have to place the sun very, very close to that. We're going to use that as a reference as well. Okay, here's what you're going to do. You want to get the sun into this position shown here. The way I did it when I lined this up was I took a piece of paper and overlaid it on my screen, and I put it up in such a way that the... Um, there was a line going from that fake star that we talked about and pretty much passing just between the two uh, bright stars we talked about before, closer to the fake one, um, but approximately as the line was shown here. And I knew when the sun was on that line, then I knew it was in the correct position and then I just needed to place the sun as close to the, um, to the small star so it was exactly not, um, not hidden, but it still uh, fit barely visible next to uh, to the sun so it's kind of in the in the 10 11 o'clock position uh, around about there 
um, that you need to uh, to place it. But I thought using that line method was actually pretty easy to get a very accurate, um, very accurate position. So while you're in this external camera mode, you can begin to fly around, and if you move your ship upwards, you will notice that the, the sun moves down. So it moves in the opposite direction. So you move up, the sun moves down the frame. It's just like having your your finger stretched out. If you move your head to the right, first uh, or to the left. Um, you will see it move in the opposite direction compared to the background. Same thing here, if you move your head up, you'll see the, your finger move down compared to the background. Same thing happening here, just on a lot bigger scale, obviously. Um, so again, move your ship around until you get the sun into uh, into that tri right position. You can also just by, do it by trial and error. You'll, you'll, this is the easy part. Um, and then you keep flying around until you have that right position. Don't worry too much about your distance. Um, but as soon as you have that in the right position, you're gonna drop down, drop down to uh, to normal space. If you at this point are further away from the sun than you need to be, then you need to align yourself up back towards the sun. If you are closer to the sun than you need to be, you need to target the sun and use your compass to make sure that the sun is directly behind you. Once it is that, you have to jump back into super cruise, slow down, and then you're gonna keep your, an eye on your distance. Once you begin to approach the correct distance, you're going to go to your navigation panel and keep a close eye there. And eventually, after you've done this, when you get into the right distance, you then once again slow down. If you can't see the uh, signal when you're at the right distance, you have to go back into the external camera mode and go through that whole process of aligning up the stars again. Keep doing that over and over until you finally find it. It will show up here in your navigation panel. As you can see, there are two. There's one called the Voyager Probe and there's one called... Ancient Probe, which is called Voyager, and one called Ancient Probe. Don't go to the one called Voyager, that's the tourist beacons. That was for normal tourists, you want to go to the Ancient Probe signal. Probe signal. And um, once you drop in there, you're here, you found it, you can now enjoy it, and listen to the music. Um, and that's pretty much how we find, found it. If that's the only thing you, uh, you want to know, then that's it. But um, now I want to talk a little bit more about the probe itself. The two Voyager probes, Voyager 1 and 2, their main mission was to go and explore Jupiter and Saturn and their moons. And we actually learned quite a lot about the mineral or atomic uh, composition of the atmosphere of some of, um, of Jupiter moons and lots of other very interesting um, um, pictures. Of course, also the Voyager probes took that uh, that uh, picture, the, the pale blue dot, I think it's, it's called, where it took a picture of, of Earth through the rings of Saturn, absolutely beautiful image. Um, but anyway, what I want to focus on now is the the end life, the, where we are now with the probes. Because as they pass through, pass close to the, um, to the two big heavy gas giants, they got a pretty good sling. Um, you can use planets to, to slingshot probes out or spacecrafts out so they can get more speed without actually using any fuel. And they did that on both those planets, meaning they of course have reached this high velocity and now they're heading out of the solar system. And with them they carry a golden record, a golden LP, on, on which there's a lot of information and then of course this gold plate on the side of the spacecraft. And that is what I want to talk about. I want to go over that gold plate, show you what the different diagrams means and why they're there, why uh, the, the actual clever thinking, because how, how do you communicate with someone who, to whom you have no language in common? How do you communicate with someone? How do you deliver a message to someone like that? And that's what, uh, that's what we're going to try and have a look at now. In the lower right corner of, uh, of the plate here, we see an illustration of the two different spin states of the hydrogen atom. So basically an atom can be in many quantum states um, and some of them will be unstable. And uh, that depends on, it's not really a spin, it's not really an actual a spin, but the, that's, it's called spin of the uh, different elements in the atom, not going to go into too much detail. But basically, the diagram here with the small uh, lines with the dots show different states of the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom is one of the the most common, if actually not the most common, um, atom in the universe, period. So it's it's very common, it should be easy to find anywhere, so there's a good chance that if anybody, anything, find this, 
that they have and they have the technology to actually understand what a probe is and they have space travel then they will probably have encountered hydrogen at some point and we'll probably also know about the spin states of the hydrogen atom and because it's the hydrogen atom is so simple it's a good chance that people are going to understand a diagram like that at least we could hope so and what this shows is it shows these two states um and this is going to be uh, used to indicate a, a fundamental unit of time so of course we cannot use seconds or hours or whatever other time people could, could think of because that's just man-made we just made up what was kind of comes out of nature but we could not explain what a second was so to do that they come up with this fundamental unit of time that is the time it takes from one atom in one state to go to, to the other it's the transition time between those two states and that's what's illustrated here. This small picture here sets the fundamental of understanding uh, time and what um, what unit of time that they're going to be using on the rest of uh, of this whole plate. Because as long as you understand have the common unit of time, you can explain a lot, which we're going to show now. Because if we move over to this diagram here, just to the left of the diagram with the uh, with the hydrogen atoms. It's a weird diagram, lots of lines with some other lines are crossing them. What this diagram is, is a representation of 14 pulsars. These are stars with, as you can imagine, with a variable uh, brightness. They have a, a they, they vary with a very specific frequency. These stars are not very common. There are very few of them. And assuming that people are going to find this in the vicinity of where we are. I mean, it's unlikely that this thing is going to be able to travel to the other the galaxy before someone finds it. Most likely, if this thing is, it's probably not, but if someone were to find it, they would most likely find it fairly close to our solar system. So seeing these pulsars have specific, um, have a specific frequency, those frequency are then displayed in binary code. It, that's base two. So again, they're going with the assumption here that that math is going to be a universally uh, like a thing that that's cannot be changed. Math, math is, is static. Of course, you would. How would they understand binary? Well, binary is the most simple counting system you can you can do. It has just two numbers, one zero, which is here represented by either a line going across, which is a one, or a line going along the line, which is a zero. And if you then take that um, that binary number and then use that unit of time, you get how many of our atom time unit uh, it it takes for the given star to go through one pulse. What's this frequency? How how uh, how quickly it, it changes its uh, its luminosity or its brightness, and the line direction that indicates which direction they are from um, from the, the sun from the Earth. So with all this information, if they can figure out that this is pulsars, which is a bit of a long shot, I think, but if they could, if someone could figure that out, they would then be able to pinpoint exactly where the solar system is. Of course, on the spacecraft, um, an, an LP was, of course, also included, as I said. And the next two diagrams we're going to look at indicates how you read the data of those uh, LPs, because they don't only contain... Um, sound they also contain a few images um so the first that uh i want to show is the one here in the upper left corner this shows a top-down view of the lp around the corner we again see binary code and the binary code again translates to a time so you take this binary code tra tra translate it over to whatever number system you use and using that uh, and with a basic time unit we just established, you now know how quickly the LP should spin. That's the rev uh, revolution time of the LP. It also shows where you should play the included cartridge with stylus. So this is basically where you should put the needle to start with um, in order to play the record. So it basically shows put the thing here and spin it this quickly. Just below that diagram, we have a, another diagram. Here we see the LP uh, edge on, and again, it shows the uh, cartridge and uh, the needle, and it shows the uh, how it should be placed just above the surface. And again, now underneath it here, we see more binary code. And this time, the binary code 
shows how um, how long time it should take the um, the needle to move from the edge to the center, which is about an hour. So this shows again how quickly you should move the needle towards the center. And of course, if you know how quickly you should spin the record, and you know um, how quickly you should move the needle inwards, you now know the how to actually read the data. Of course, then you need to assume that they are spinning it in the right direction. Um, but we kind of hope they would figure that out. Or at least it's a 50-50 chance, otherwise you can hear everything in reverse. In the upper right corner, we see a small waveform. And each of these small blocks of waves is part of an image. Underneath the waveform, the first waveform, we can uh, again see more binary code. And this time, it of course, shows how big the block are, how much time should it take to reach such a block if you manage to play back the, uh, the record at the uh, specifics um, in the specific um, order that was shown uh, before with the correct rotation, rotation speed and everything. Um, and each of these small blocks, you can see here the numbered one, two, three again in binary. Each of these blocks then consists of one line or, or one, one column of uh, pixels in an image. Uh, so it would take one of these and you would then put that into one line of an image. And to, to try and communicate that, if we move down, we will see how these lines should be placed. We can see the scan direction here, and it also says in binary code how many, um, how many lines are per image. And there are 512, in case you're wondering. So we need 512 of these small um, waveform blocks, and each waveform block would then be a line, and that would all progress into, uh, into an image. And then the final image down below here, which a circle, shows the first picture that will come up, which is just a picture with a perfect circle on it. So then you pretty much know, well, if you get that picture, then we're pretty much right. Um, so this is pretty much how it works. Um, I'll show you some of the pictures that are stored on, um, on the record here in, uh, in the background and uh, play a little bit of the music that's also on the, on the disc. And of course, there are voices from... Uh, of human speaking, human uh, sounds of, of, of people and nature and lots of other, st uh, of other stuff. I mean, go and look it up if you're interested. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, but anyway, that's, um, that's it for today. I really hope you like this type of video. It's a little different than usual. If you did, give it a like down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can go down, you can become a Patreon and support the channel a little bit more directly. And until next time, guys. I will see you guys in space.